So get that done and go to presentation mode. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about pumps today, and um, let's go ahead and jump into it here. Uh, okay. So if you look at the energy flow uh, from uh, from PVA from the local distributor all the way through the pump, the fluid system, the ultimate goal. Uh, each step along the way can have uh, inefficiencies. And, you know, so the purpose of this is to get the most, deliver the most flow at the minimum uh, amount of energy. And so, you know, you can at least consider, for example, an adjustable speed drive has losses. So if you're out there, you know, you're proud of your VFD, but you always run it on 60 hertz, guess what? You're shooting yourself in the foot. So you've got to be able to slow the pump down in order to utilize a VFD. Um, and so we'll cover, uh, you know, we're not going to talk much about the electrical components on this. There's not a lot you can do about some of that. But anyway, we'll move through this. Here's some comments about um, the different uh, steps along the way. Uh, some stuff, like I said, we can't do much with. Uh, we will talk a little bit about VFDs, motors. We mentioned some motor characteristic coupling. You know, if you're belt driven, uh, there are energy savings going to uh, more efficient types of belts, depending on what you're using, but that's not our topic here today. And we will talk a good bit about pumps uh, systems. Uh, the ultimate goal, um, that's a good thought process. If you look back over here, um, you know, you, you sit back and you go, well, why in the heck are we running this pumping system to start? With? What, is the, what is the job? Is it a condenser water pump on a chiller? Well, how much heat do we have to reject? Uh, how much should we be pumping? What's a reasonable head? And if you're cooling equipment, whatever, or you know, whatever the purpose of the pump, uh, you can kind of do a common sense analysis and say, well, how much should it cost me to do this, just in rough terms? And then you can go take a measurement on the motor and say, well, uh, this is how much it is costing me. These two things don't really match up. There's something going on here. So the ultimate goal is always important to keep in mind. Um, screening. I know uh, some of the, the folks on work at uh, large uh, industrial facilities, and you may have a bunch of different uh, pumps out there. I know I've been in paper mills that had pumping systems up in the thousands. And so how do you figure out what you should look at? How do you prioritize? How do you uh, screen? And so uh, that's what um, this slide is looking at. And you can apply this to other you can apply it to fan systems and other plant motor driven systems. But basically filter, you know, you start out there with, with everything or all your pumping systems. And, you know, if it's a small load, you don't use it much. Well, turn it off and you don't need it, move on. So that leaves us then larger loads that run a lot. The second filter here is if it's a non-centrifugal load, because centrifugal loads react very well to like speed changes and there's typically with centrifugal loads uh, you have good energy management prospects. Uh, and so um, if it's non-centrifugal or it already has adjustable speed controls then you've probably done the project and so it's either moderate priority or you handle it with policies and practices. So this leaves us with big centrifugal loads that run a lot. And then basically we start looking for a symptom that would make us think that there's some inefficiency. Uh, the symptoms for pumping systems are this sort of thing. It's probably not exhaustive, but it's a pretty good list. Uh, you know, throttle, uh, throttle valve controlled systems. I mean, you know, if your control valve is always modulating between 20% and 60%. Well, guess what? The pump is a little bit too large. And I'm gonna this Okay. Um, so, the, you know, the, you, can, uh, you can control a pump with a BFD instead of a throttling valve, and there's generally good energy savings. Uh, recirculation line. You see big industrial facilities, sometimes you'll come off of the pump discharge, a suction tank, and there's a big research line with a valve in it, or a lot sometimes they don't even have a valve, and um, that valve is open. And so you're researching. So whatever goes through that research line, you're just pumping around and around in a circle, unless you're trying to stir the tank or something, you know, unless you have some purpose for doing that. If it's because the pump's too big, 
then that's extremely wasteful. Uh, multiple parallel pump systems where you always use the same number of pumps and the requirements of flow from that system vary over time. Uh, that's a good characteristic that uh, you might want to look into. Uh, if you have a batch process operation, where you make a batch of material uh, and then you have to stop, retool, reload, and then cook another batch, and, but you always, but you have pumps associated with that, and you always run the pumps, then perhaps those pumps could be shut off in between batch. Uh, cavitation, I think we probably know what that is. That's where the pressure in the system goes too low. It goes uh, below the, to or below the vapor pressure, and basically we boil the fluid, uh, the it, it, vapor bubbles form in the fluid, uh, like boiling, and that goes through a pump or a valve. It can, it, it, oftentimes with the suction of a pump, we get pressure low enough, we have cavitation. Uh, on the backside of a valve, if it's pinched enough, we can get pressure so low that we cavitate. It'll tear up the pump, it'll tear up the valve. So that's an indication that we need to look at that system. If you have high maintenance costs on that, you should be investigating that. And also, if you have uh, undergone a change of function, uh, perhaps you took out a line that required a bunch of flow, uh, no longer need that flow, you didn't change the pump, you just basically off, off something and drove you up the pump. So these are all possible uh, symptoms of waste. Um, okay, uh, we don't, we're not gonna do a bunch of equations, we'll do a couple, but for, uh, uh, Pumping fluid power, which here I've termed it water horsepower. Um, if, for example, uh, well, it's a simple equation, flow rate GPM feet ahead times specific gravity divided by 3960. So like if you go through a pump and you increase the feet of head, the pressure, feet of head is pressure, um, from the inlet to the exit of the pump by a certain amount, this can tell you how much energy actually entered the fluid as a result of going through the pump. Uh, if you drop pressure across a valve, this can tell you how much energy uh, you dropped out of the, um, the fluid as a result of the pressure. So, very simple equation. So, this is power, a rate of using energy. And so, you know, we got two variables, right? We got flow rate and we got feet of head. And then this integrated over time uh, is energy. Right? So power times time is energy. So what do we wind up with? We got three variables we can work on. We can reduce the run time, we can reduce the flow rate, or we can reduce the head or some combination of this uh, in order to reduce the energy use. Or uh, This just looks at some relationships with efficiencies. So for example, over here, I've got my uh, water horsepower or the fluid power increase as a result of the flow going through the pump. On this side, way over here on this side, I've got the electrical power coming into the motor. And so I've got inefficiencies in the motor. Uh, I could have be belt driven. In this case, I've shown direct drive. If I was belt driven, I would have inefficiency in that drive. I have inefficiency in the pump. And so, on where you want to start. If you start over here and look at the uh, electric power input to the motor, that times the motor efficiency, probably 92 to 95 percent, uh, will give you the shaft power out of the motor that is going into the pump. Um, and we call typically call that a brake horsepower. Okay, and so if you uh, have the brake horsepower or shaft power, and then you know the efficiency of the pump, then maybe at 70, 75 percent, 80 percent, that you do that multiplication, and that shows you what the fluid energy increase, the water horsepower should be, based on electrical measure. So the way the way in pumping analysis we typically would calculate a pump efficiency is we would measure the pressures over here and the, the the pipe size and the flow rate and all that. We would calculate a water horsepower. We would take an electrical measurement on this side because we're very good at that. Uh, we would look up a motor efficiency at whatever percent load we think the motor is, and that would give us the brake horsepower. And then we would divide these two, the water horsepower by the brake horsepower, and that would be the calculated pump efficiency. And we'll get to the piece that we've got a couple of pieces of software that really help us. 
uh, USDOE sponsored. The older program is PSAT, P-S-A-T. Uh, it is still downloadable. Um, and then the newer uh, incantation of this is in the measure, M-E-A-S-U-R. Uh, I think they pronounce it measure, and that's an acronym. I don't remember exactly. But anyway, there is a, the PSAT program has been translated and is also accessible through Measure. We'll see some uh, screenshots of that. Uh, and this slide just indicates if we add a BFD, we're potentially adding another loss to the system. And that was my comment earlier. If this is operating on 60 hertz, we have the inefficiency of the drive. We're actually going to up the input power with no benefit. It, it, we're going to use more energy instead of less. So if you got a VFD, you've got to have that thing modulated back uh, off of hertz. Uh, okay, a little bit more on equations, and we'll hit this quick. If you had a fluid mechanics, you probably recognize these names. Um, you, probably the Bernoulli uh, equation is what uh, Bernoulli somehow got his name on the equation. I guess Euler got screwed in the middle of the process. But anyway, they kind of developed this at the same time a long time ago. And so this equation is basically uh, for frictionless flow. And it says on a streamline, uh, we can have basically three types of energy. We can have kinetic energy and velocity, we can have pressure energy, and we can have potential energy in elevation. And so if we assume frictionless flow, uh, this is going to be equal as the fluid moves through the piping system. And so if you look at this little diagram, you notice so we're assuming steady state flow. Um, and so uh, we have a smaller pipe diameter over here. Well, a small diameter is going to give us a larger velocity. We go through an expander, and all of a sudden, we've got a much larger pipe diameter, which means that velocity is going to fall. So in this diagram along this streamline, V2 squared over 2G has to be much less than V1 squared over 2G because of the change in pipe diameter. Well, the elevation's about the same. So what's that tell you about the pressure? Well, this pressure is going to have to go up relative P2 has got to be greater than P1 if V2 is less than V1. And so it just shows you that we can trade off pressure and velocity energy and even at, you know potential energy if the pipe is going vertical uh, as the fluid goes through the system. And so that's just kind of a, a, an important fundamental concept that we need to uh, be aware of. Um, okay, but of course we know in the real world there is friction. Uh, and so the question is how important is it? Well, it just depends. Uh, sometimes there are systems that are static head dominated where friction doesn't play a huge role. In other cases, we have friction only systems where friction is the only end that we're concerned. So the answer is this, sometimes a little and sometimes a lot. It depends what you're looking for. Um, well, sources of friction, I think we all know every, every component the fluid goes through uh, has a frictional loss associated with it. Just for straight pipe, as the, you know, we have the, the zero velocity is zero at the pipe wall, and so we have um, frictional losses uh, with respect to the pipe walls, uh, valves, you know, the flow goes through even an open valve, there's a pressure. Uh, elbows, T's, uh, reducers, expanders, everything, uh, expansion joints, tank inlets, outlets, all that. In other words, everything and the fluid itself because there's most flows are turbulent. And so a turbulent flow is going to eat up some pumping energy and turn it into a small increase in heat. It's hard to measure, but still there is a, a frictional loss associated with the turbulence in the fluid itself. Okay, uh, for uh, pipe friction losses in straight pipe, uh, we usually use the Darcy Weisbach equation, which you, if you've done any pumping work at all or back in your fluids course, you've probably seen. Uh, very simple relationship, <clears throat> uh, and we see that there's head loss, and the, it will produce the head loss due to friction in feet. Well, we've got the length of the pipe. It could be a thousand feet divided by the diameter. If it's six inches, it'd be a half foot. Um, 
if that was a thousand over a half, that would be that ratio would be two thousand. Then we've got the average velocity across the uh, cross section of the pipe, v squared over two g, and uh, g would be the gravitational constant. Uh, and then we've got the friction factor. And as my old fluids prof used to say, all of these terms are real easy. We put all of our ignorance and complication into the friction factor, which appears are one, there's different places to obtain the friction factor. Designers often go to a moody chart, and this is starting to get into some more detailed fluid mechanics. Basically, you've got a Reynolds number over here, which characterizes the flow. You've got laminar flow over here, which is much simpler, the transition region. You've got turbulent flow, and so this is still some transition. The dotted line indicates complete turbulence. And, and on this, this uh, axis, we have the relative roughness. Um, based on the material of the pipe, you have a roughness number. These are typical values. And then this is the relative roughness is E over D, the roughness over here divided by the pipe diameter. And so in order to read a friction factor, you calculate your Reynolds number, uh, density, average velocity, diameter of the pipe over viscosity, that's a dimensionless number. You uh, calculate your E over D, you come up and over and read a friction factor. If you do a lot of design work, you just have standard friction factors that you use for different types of pipe. Uh, if you don't know, you can get in the literature and you can find, you know, it, it doesn't have to be this comp that, you know, when you get into the fluid mechanics of it, it, it does. London up here. Uh, I clicked that one. Okay. Yeah, okay. There's Moody. Not sure what I did, but anyway. Um, okay. So uh, for the uh, piping components, we usually uh, look up a loss coefficient. Uh, it's oftentimes called K, the uh, loss coefficient. Um, and that comes from manufacturer's literature. When we calculate the velocity head, V squared over 2G, average velocity in the pipe. We multiply those together, and that gives us the head loss for the uh, particular fitting or valve, whatever. Uh, if it's a valve, uh, that K value is going to change as a function of valve position. Later, here are some typical <clears throat> values uh, for like a 90 degree standard elbow, 0.2 to 0.3, uh, long radius elbow, 0.1 to 0.3 square edge down from a tank, a half, etc. You can read those. Notice though the gate valve, full open, 0.03 to 0.2. That's a wide range. And so some of these things have a pretty wide range. And so what happens, why, why pumps uh, uh, are, tend to be oversized is because the designer, uh, if, if you're laying down a system, you're gonna pick the largest number in this range because you don't know which manufacturer's uh, component is gonna be put in. And you would have a pump that has, uh, is larger than is needed compared to one that is smaller than needed because when you turn the thing on after you build it, you're supposed to get a thousand GPM and you get 800 GPM, people are really upset. So everybody rounds up. So the designer expects one that, you know, is a thousand, the contractor's liable to put one in that, that can provide 1200 just to be sure, but they don't want to mess with it. So, and it's the conservative nature of the design process. Pumps tend to be oversized. And I must say, if I was designing the system, I'd probably be real careful to make sure that the pump was, was maybe a little bigger uh, just because of the uncertainty. You're never sure how the pipe's actually going to get routed. Okay. Uh, so we can go back to Bernoulli real quick, and um, we can add the frictional loss. So if we want to include the friction in this, so we have a certain total energy at one on the streamline, 
uh, kinetic energy, uh, pressure energy, and elevation or potential energy. And so if we, if we add it up at one and add it up at two, they're not going to equal each other if there's friction because friction has eaten up some of the energy that we had at one. So if we calculate those frictional lines, uh, we can add them in, then we can make the equation balance again. Okay, where does a pumping system operate? So this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. Uh, at the intersection of the pump curve and the system curve. It's going to be the operating point. That's kind of, you know, just the golden rule of pumping. Okay, well, where do you get pump curves? Well, you get those from manufacturers. And I think everybody on the call is probably pretty experienced in, you can go online with a model number, you can select pumps online, you can download curves, get them from the pump supplier anyway. You can get the pump curve as long as you know what pump. Um, the system curve, however, that's up to the analyst. So like I said, the system designer would calculate this. But if you're going out there in the field working on an existing pump, you have to figure out and know how to draw this curve. And then we put them in the same plot. You can do this in Excel is what I typically would do. Uh, I'll fit a system curve. I'll get an equation. I'll plot it up. I'll pull for you know, somehow import the uh, pump curve. You can pull points off the curve and plot it up, make sure it looks like the one the manufacturer sent, whatever. But you have to you gotta really do the analysis on the pump. You have to draw these two curves. Well, so uh, we're going to spend uh, some time here on uh, talking about system curves because it, everybody that does pumping work is familiar with pump curves. Not everybody is really uh, familiar with system curves. Uh, the idea is the system curve describes everything else in the system except the pump. And it shows, well, how much head do we need to move different flow rates through that piping system? And if you're going to draw one pump curve, if you have modulating valves, you're, you're drawing this curve for one particular valve set. Now, some people will draw an envelope of curves and say, okay, when the valve is in its minimum position, I'm here, when the valve's in its maximum position, Position on here, and I could operate any place within this envelope, and, and that's that's perfectly correct. It's just if you're going to run numbers, we usually would pick an average condition or several average conditions where we think that pump would operate, and draw the specific uh, pump curve for those uh, valve positions. Okay, what's the equation of a system curve look like? Well, its head total is equal to the static head in the system plus a, uh, a loss coefficient. And this is not the same. This is something that we fit in this process. So it's unfortunate that it's K again, and we use the Ks for the, the fitting. Um, K is just an overworked variable. I apologize for that. But we call that K prime times the flow. Uh, probably in US units, this would be GPM. It could be meters cubed per hour. You're working metric, whatever, raised to an exponent. Uh, the theoretical exponent is two, but these slides, uh, and I need to credit uh, a friend of mine, Don Cassida, who uh, wrote the PSAT program. Uh, Don, most of these slides were created by Don. I've stuck a few of my own in here. Uh, Don worked at Oak Ridge for a number of years and um, was one of the very best pumping engineers uh, that's out there. He is now retired. Um, and Don's not doing pumps anymore, uh, and, but he's a great individual and a really excellent engineer, and I want to credit Don with most of the material that I am presenting. Okay, um, static head we'll talk about. If you have a closed system that's just pumping around all enclosed in pipe, there is no static. Uh, a chill water loop, a hot water loop, uh, may well is probably going to be a closed loop. Denser water loops are usually open loops where the water comes out of the basin at the base of the cooling tower is pumped through whatever equipment has to be cooled, goes back up to the top of the tower and is discharged to atmosphere, falls down in the basins and then goes to the tower. Well, there's an elevation change there from the water level at, in the basin up to the top of the tower where the water leaves the pipe. That could be 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 feet on a big cooling tower or potentially more. So that's just one example of an open system 
network flow system. Uh, open systems generally will have some static head. Uh, closed systems generally do not. Okay, so more about static head refers, as I've already uh, alluded to, the change in elevation from, say, a suction tank to a discharge tank. So a lot of industrial processes, you've got, you know, uh, a fluid uh, real close, the pumps are maybe right in front of it. Uh, it could be a well, it could have vertical turbine pumps, whatever, but you've got a, a, a source of fluid, a tank, a well close by, and we're gonna pump it to another tank, uh, which may be setting up on a hill, or maybe down in the valley, whatever, but there's an elevation change. Uh, a lot of systems, especially, especially chemical processing, uh, require uh, nitrogen blankets on tanks, and so they will have uh, uh, gas overpressure. And if you have an overpressure in the tank, you might be maintaining five, you know, two, three, five PSI. And so that has to be taken into uh, uh, calculation of the static head. So it's the static head is basically the change of potential energy of fluid as it moves from the suction to the discharge tank. Uh, static heads can be positive, negative, or zero. So if your suction tank is up on the hill and your uh, discharge tank is down in the valley, then you can have a negative uh, static head as well. And the reason you have a pump is you can't afford to put in a big enough pipe to get it to just flow down there by gravity. You've got to push a little bit and that fires. Okay, so here's a little picture to illustrate this a little more clearly. So we've got two tanks, a suction tank, a discharge tank. I have uh, four pressure gauges in my system. For the static discussion, we're only going to use P1 and P4. We'll come back and talk about pump head in a second and use P2 and P3. Uh, and for this diagram, just kind of by the by, we're assuming that the pipe diameter on the discharge is the same, which it may be a lot of pumping systems. The discharge pipe will be a little bit smaller than the suction pipe. And we got a flow meter. So, uh, here is an equation that will do this, and uh, for these P's, I'm assuming that we have uh, PSIG, gauge pressure, in pounds per square inch. And so, uh, again, if I have uh, an overpressure at P4 and an overpressure at P1, then I would put those in and multiply it by um, 144 uh is i've got inches in here i got to get rid of them to feet and then this is the specific weight of water if it's standard water uh it's 60.3 uh, pounds force per cubic foot and so this arithmetic for standard water produces 231 and so that's a number that, that we see all the time so for standard water uh this term would be the delta p times 2.31 not standard water, we would divide that by the gravity. Uh, and specific gravity is the density of the fluid you're pumping divided by the density of standard water. And then just the elevation change. So whatever this free surface in this tank uh, and the free surface in this tank, whatever the elevation difference is that, that's this elevation. And that's measured. So Z1, we would establish a datum down here someplace and measure Z4 and Z1 and then Z1. Uh, sources of uh, static head data, you know, the pressure gauges, elevation, drawings, etc. You know, it's not too hard to come up with. Okay, so just uh, having some numbers to insert. Uh, let's say we had 20 pounds on the discharge tank, uh, and we had 10 pounds on the suction tank. So 20 minus 10 is 10, and so 10 times 2.31, we're pumping standard water, is 23.1 feet, and that goes toward my static head. And then I have my elevation change, which is Z4 minus Z1, we're saying it's 40 feet. So I add those two together, and so my total static head on this system is 23.1 feet. Okay. And so this, <clears throat> that's a potential energy change. That has nothing to do with friction. That, that static head is there whether I run the pump or not. But if I want to take fluid from that suction tank and take it up to that discharge tank, I have to overcome C 
63.1 feet of head. And then I'll have frictional losses through my system that I have to overcome as well. Okay, so uh, let's go after the frictional head portion of this. Well, I mean, it's a pretty simple equation uh, that we had before. So total head is static head plus, and that K prime Q to the 1.9 is the frictional head. Uh, that, and so if you want to solve for frictional head, well, you just move the terms around in the equation. So total head minus um, static head is friction head. So, and we also remember that if I walk up to a pump, um, it's operating at the intersection of the pump curve and the system curve. So if I can determine the operating point for that pump, then that point is on the system curve. So that's very often my second point that I need to calculate my system. So, um, so we'll see as we go forward. Okay, so now we're going to use the other two gauges, the P2 and P3, and we also note that we have a, a 1.4 foot elevation difference between the two gauges, because to get the fluid from the level of the suction to the discharge, that pump had to uh, produce an extra 1.4 head to raise the fluid, so that has to go into the calculation of the pump. Okay. So. Putting some uh, pressures for the gauges, we've got, uh, we're saying that the, and of course, it's always good to use your own gauges, pressure gauges that you have some confidence in. You know, I think you all probably have enough experience to know when you just walk out there in the field and look at a pressure gauge, it's hard to tell how good that gauge is. So it's good to uh, take your own gauges, ones that you know are calibrated and in good shape. And it's even not a bad idea. If, if nothing's changing on the system, you can use the same gauge and take the suction pressure and the discharge pressure. Like I said, if valves are constant and nothing's really changing, that way there's no discrepancy between the gauges. But either, either way, you gotta get good pressure. So we got 53 PSIG on the discharge, 12.6 uh, uh, PSIG on the suction. Uh, pipe size is the same, so there's no velocity head change from suction to discharge, and 1.4 feet. And so uh, we just take the, the delta P, uh, 53 minus 12.6 times uh, 2.31, and that's 93.3 feet, uh, plus the 1.4 that the pump also has to do. So our pump head at this point is 94.7 feet, and I've got my strap on ultrasonic flow meter measuring 3000 ppm so there you go and that that point is on the pump curve and it's also on the system curve because that's where that pump is operating at that particular point in time now okay this is a screenshot from uh, the pump head calculator in PSAT and I've got one from uh, measure as well uh, I must say the the PSAT uh, program, the screen captures show up better, so I kind of like that. But they, they do the same thing, and they're, they're both a very good program. Uh, you actually have a different geometry, and this isn't live, so I can't pull down. You could actually do this if you have a suction tank back here and don't have a suction gauge. Anyway, uh, in this example, we had the suction gauge, so we're working from this figure. And so you simply plug in, um, if you have the same, um, pipe diameter, then there's no change in kinetic energy. So this, it doesn't really matter. I stuck in a 12 inch pipe on both sides of these. Uh, here's my suction gauge, 12.6, and my discharge gauge, 53. Uh, I've, I said that the, uh, the measurement of the suction gauge was three foot off the floor, 4.4. Uh, so that difference is gonna produce that 1.4 feet of elevation head. Uh, and then uh, this program, uh, you can put in loss coefficients because you may have some fittings. You could have a strainer, uh, you could have a check valve, well, that's probably on the other side, but anyway, you could have expanders, you could have a gate valve that's wide open. And so you could have pressure drop from the point of the suction measurement into the suction gland of the pump. If you do, you simply put in those loss coefficients here and it would be taken 
into consideration in the calculation of the pump hit. Likewise, uh, you, you may have uh, components, gate valves, whatever on this side, and you put in the summation of those loss coefficients over here, and again, and then those would be taken into consideration. So, but I set this up to match the uh, calculated head over here, and we're not, we don't have any friction losses between the gauges and the pump here, so I put in zeros here, and you see we get 94.76 feet. Probably a little more accurate calculation than this, because you know there's a, there's a little bit of rounding going off here. But anyway, basically they get uh, the same value. So once you get used to this uh, head calculator, it's very very nice. Um, it's always instructive when I teach a class. I make students do this by hand. So after you do it by hand a couple of times, you really appreciate what the uh, uh, software will uh, do for you. And this is uh, from the measure uh, tool. Uh, it's the pump head calculator there. It doesn't show up quite as well, but I put in the same, it's the same picture, it's the same inputs, and you get in both of them. Okay, so now we've got two points, and it turns out it takes just two points to define a system curve. Uh, and so we have the static head, which occurs at zero flow. So that's this point, and we have our, what, 94.7 feet at 3,000 GPM, which occurs over here. So then the question is, uh, I've got what I need to fit the system curve, but how do I connect the points? How do I actually draw the curve? Well, this is the algebra, and so, you know, and you can do this, absolutely, or the PSAT program and measure have system curve calculator tools where you just plug in the two points and it gives you the static head and the loss coefficient. Um, and back here, you don't have to put in the static. You can put in any two points on this curve that you know. It's just, it's, it's usually very easy to determine the static head. So it's common to use the zero flow point in static head, but you don't have to. Any two, you know, you could take this measurement, you could um, um, uh, you know, somehow come up with another point on this curve uh, based on, you know, other operations, whatever. You get two points and you can fit the, uh, okay. So uh, this is the, uh, the algebra that goes on. So head two, or the, what, 94.7 is equal to head static, 63.1, plus the K, the prime didn't get put on here, but the K, the, con the constant, times 3,000, and we're showing an exponent of two here, okay? So um, if you know the static head, then you only need one equation, but if you were using two points and didn't know the static head, then you would have to write that equation. You would write it again at uh, point one, and then you would have uh, two equations and two unknowns. The equation would be the static head and the K. You solve those, uh, you subtract, and this solves for the K, and you plug in and solve for the static head based on an operating point. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, when you draw the curve, it looks something like that. And of course, this isn't drawn through zero. If you went zero, this thing would be over. The zero point uh, for feet of head is way down here someplace. Um, the way you can think about this is here is your static head, and then the uh, K prime Q to the exponent is at different flow rates is the frictional head. You're picking up this frictional curve and setting it on top of the static curve, and then this becomes my overall system up here. Okay. Uh, this is uh, from PSAT. This is in the background information of PSAT. So you can, uh, uh, it asks for specific gravity because it's going to calculate the fluid power. Uh, this is GPM feet of head uh, times specific gravity divided by 3960. I mean, you can check it for right here, but it, it comes out. Uh, this is the exponent, the C value. Uh, in this case, uh, we used 1.9, uh, 
And then this is the static headpoint, zero flow at 63.1. Uh, and if you want uh, it to put a dot someplace on the curve for you, maybe for a report, then you can do a screen capture of this forever. Uh, you can put in uh, some alternative point here. It's sitting on static heads, so it's putting an extra dot there, which it already has. Uh, so it shows you the calculated static head, which in this case is what you put in, 63.1. And here's this uh, K prime, the uh, loss coefficient. Uh, it's 7.8191 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay. And so that goes into this form of the equation, and that is your system curve. Uh, if you want to, you can click this button. Uh, and it will export, it will put these coefficients in an Excel file and let you name the file and put it out there. And you can do that or you can write down the coefficients and just program them into your own Excel file. Whatever you want to do, it's pretty simple. Uh, and this is uh, in measure, it has a similar situation. You put in the points uh, and it calculates, that's the same situation it in either pieces. Okay, uh, we do need to keep in mind that there are some process factors that can affect or change the system curve, and some of these not exhaustive uh, in list, but <clears throat> uh, static head variables, gas overpressures can change. They have a regulator or you know, it just may change with time. The level in the tanks can change, and that will affect the static head. And if you got a tank that's sitting outside, that fluid is going to be warmer in the summer, colder perhaps in the winter, and the density will, and that will change. Well, <laughs> um, dynamic loss uh, coefficient variables, uh, certainly valve position. Every time that valve position changes, we change that system curve. Uh, temperature changes can change viscosity, which can change the uh, coefficient. Uh, age, we get corrosion scale, build up in the pipes. I know you guys work out there, you cut the pipe open and you go, ah, oh, I thought I had a six inch pipe. Nah, I got about a four and a half inch pipe because we got build up on the inside of the pipe. And it also changes, you know, the friction factor for that surface because it's no longer a clean air metal on the pipe. Uh, filters or strainers, you know, have you changed your, uh, clean your strainer lately? Uh, those things get clogged up and you get a different system. Uh, and you may change the system itself. You may actually break the pipes loose and change the configuration. So all of that stuff can change the uh, system curve, which will change the operating point. Um, I think we've pretty well uh, said this, um, you know, the, the case for the importance of the system curve. So I'll let you all read that on your own. Uh, okay, so we're, we're going to look at uh, three different types of systems here. Uh, one would be one with zero static head, and you can tell the static head, just look at the zero flow point. If the curve uh, goes through zero, zero, then you have no static head. This, so I've got, so this is an all frictional system. Then I've got one that's kind of intermediate. It has, well, 60 something feet of, uh, 70 feet uh, static head, and then some friction on top of that. And then this says static only, well, there is no, really, there is no static only system, because it, unless you're not pushing any fluid through it, there's any fluid flow, not some friction. But you have what you call static dominated curves that are pretty darn flat. And so we'll then combine these with some pump curves here to see how the systems react uh, differently. Okay, pump performance. So, you know, this is how we calculate the pump head. We just saw the Bernoulli with the pump head put in there. And again, if you had friction losses here, you could have some extra friction here. Uh, this will cover the velocity terms uh, based on, you know, you probably have a steady flow rate through here. And so this would be the velocity in this size pipe. This would be the velocity in this size pipe, pressures, elevations. Okay, uh, there's an actual uh, pump curve. So um, I, 
probably don't need to spend too much time. I'll make a few comments about this. This is actually from Bell and Gossett. I mean, there's lots of good old and Worthington. There's a all, all flow, sir. There's all kinds of phones. Um, this one was actually selected. This is the Brown Hall the Mechanical Engineering Building at Tennessee Tech. It's selected for 310 GPM, 160 feet ahead. At any rate, um, so this particular pump has this impeller in it, 12.875 inches. The max impeller for this pump uh, is 13.5. The minimum is 10, any place in here. So this pump, this impeller is big enough that if for some reason I chose, I thought this pump was oversized, it was throttled, I could do an impeller trim. I could, I could trim this one down to 10 inches if that would still supply the fluid that I need and reduce my energy needs. Uh, that's something you can think of. So if you're if you're considering an impeller trim, you got to get your overall pump or get information and see what the minimum impeller that can be operated in there. You don't want to put a smaller than 10 in. Um, we have lines of ISO efficiency, 55 up to 75 percent. There's 75%. You can see uh, here's my uh, pump curve. So my max efficiency, there's 74. It's not getting to 75. Uh, let's see. There's good. Mm. Well, it gives some information over here. Um, there's, there's 300. There's what? 350. Uh, well, no, not quite. But anyway, 310 someplace in here. So I'm going to be pumping. Uh, it probably gives me an efficient, uh, efficiency at duty point. So that's a printout, about, uh, basically 70%. It also is suggesting a 30 horse motor, which would be a non-overloading motor for this impeller, is a good idea. So you wouldn't want to put a 25 horse motor on this guy, even though it looks like it's fine. But what if somebody comes in and opens a valve or something and the flow goes up here? You know, that might be enough to damage a 25 horsepower. Certainly would damage a 20 horsepower if uh, you started pushing 600. And on. So that's, that's typically a good idea. So anyway, um, oh, the other thing we see, net positive suction head required. This is to avoid cavitation on the pump. So at, you know, at three, 310, someplace down here, uh, in terms of feet, it looks like, uh, it looks like I'm about seven or eight feet. The number published here, actually we're already slightly in cavitation. The standard is 3% uh, pump head degradation uh, in the testing rig at the number they published. So if, it, if I was to be selecting this pump, I would probably wanna see at least 20 feet 20 to 25 to 30 feet of uh, suction head uh, available at the suction flange of the pump, just to guarantee that I wasn't gonna have cavitation issues. Uh, that's a, a larger pump, that's a Worthington. Uh, this is 8,000, 10,000 GPM. But you see, you get, it's the same kind of a picture. Uh, in PSH, this one puts uh, feet and meters. Uh, capacity, meters cubed per hour up here, GPM, all that sort of thing. Um, and notice that uh, these curves are at a particular speed. Uh, I didn't notice, I didn't note that on the previous. This is 1180 uh, RPM. Uh, this one is uh, 1750 RPM. And so when we get out on the field, we'll want to take a strobe and measure the rotational speed of that pump. And if it's significantly different than the speed at the, which the, the curve is published, then we have to use the affinity laws to adjust the pump curve. And we'll see those uh, in a minute here. Okay, well, as a matter of fact, we'll see them right now. So those are the pump affinity laws. And so it's important to, to, to read this. Affinity laws can be used to predict pump curves at different speeds and impeller diameter. It doesn't say anything about predicting operating point. The correct use of these is to recast your pump curve. 
Now, there's certain specialized, certain particular cases where you can get a decent number on power by using this. But that's not really what you're supposed to do because if you have a static dominated system, you get wrong answers. If you have an all frictional system, you get reasonable answers. Uh, what I tell my students is just don't do it. Do the analysis the correct way and then you're assured to get the correct result. Okay, so uh, this, this column is looking at speed changes at constant diameter. This column is looking at diameter changes at constant speed. Okay, and so uh, if we keep the diameter the same, we see if we, if we double the speed, we're gonna double the flow. If we cut the speed in half, we're gonna cut the flow in half. First power inflation. Head, however, is that speed ratio of squared. So if I double the flow, the head's going up by, required head's gonna go up by a factor or the head for that, if I'm recasting that point on the pump curve, power associated with that point would go up with that factor cube. So if I double the speed, the power goes up by a factor of eight. If I cut the speed in half, the power falls to one eighth of what it was before. But that's translating the point on the pump curve. That's not necessarily the operating point that you're gonna get. And, um, the uh, for speed changes the uh, this is a zero power so we keep the same efficiency of the pump okay. uh, and so this is analogous to um, constant speed with diameter changes and it's basically the same relationship exponents okay so move on now this was uh, Don Cassida took data at Oak Ridge this was back in 08 where he started with a 19-inch uh, impeller, and this is in their great test facilities at the National Lab, and he said, okay, well, so he determined this is the full-size impeller that he had, and then he said, okay, well, I'm gonna trim this. Thing. I'm gonna use the affinity laws and predict the pump curve, and then I'm gonna trim it, and I'm gonna measure the pump curve. So you can see this kind of magenta-colored curve uh, is the affinity law prediction of this curve translated to uh, a two-inch trim in impeller. And then when they, when they took it and then when they did it, polished it up, put it in the pump and took it out there, they got uh, this whatever, color blind, green, orange, whatever, I guess that's green, whatever it is, the curve right below it. So you can say, well, you know, that's pretty close, you know, um, not bad. And then they said, okay, well, let's cut, uh, let's cut two more inches off of it. So that's a four inch impeller trim. That's, that's probably getting down to the minimum impeller size that you put in this pump. Here's the affinity law, and here's the measure performance. And you see they start to deviate by a fair amount. So the recommendation gets made. There we go. We'll go back in a second. But uh, considerations relative to impeller diameter, it's fine to use the affinity laws for a first order analysis, but you're better to go back to the manufacturer and get the actual pump curve or the diameter that you're considering trimming to. Okay. Um, and this, uh, this slide just shows that um, the affinity laws do a good job uh, on speed changes. So, and, and, and so this is, this is kind of what it looks like. You know, if you say you have done this in Excel, so you've punched in this top curve. And oh, by the way, BEP is best efficiency point. So when you look on a pump curve, you typically will see a notation of BEP. That's where the pump is gonna be happiest in operating at its BEP. So for this pump, uh, that, uh, that's the point and the efficiency is 80.5%. Um, and so if you take the, uh, the flow and the head at that point, looks like it's a little under 100 feet and, I don't know, 3,600, whatever, 3,500. And then um, if you take 90% of the flow, you'll come here, and then you have to take that 90% squared times this initial head to get the head, and then you just replot that point. And you come up here and you replot a point here and I replot a point here and 
all of these points, and then you can draw the smooth curve between there. And so you can uh, draw what the, the pump curve at whatever speed you want it. 100% is the speed that the manufacturer published. I'll read that. Uh, let's look at uh, parallel pumps uh, and uh, series pumps, how we would uh, uh, do an equivalent curve for parallel pumping or series pumping. And the basic law is that for uh, parallel pumps, we uh, sum the flow rates at a given head. So we pick a head and then we just look and see what each pump could produce at that head, add that up and put, a, put that point out there. And we do that for enough heads, we draw a smooth curve and that becomes the equivalent parallel. For series pumps, we sum heads at a given flow because the flow goes through one pump, it gets a certain pressure increase and the same flow goes through a second pump and gets a certain pressure increase. Okay, so uh, this is what it looks like. This is um, uh, uh, taking uh, one pump and uh, taking the same pump, I mean identical pumps, and doing uh, an equivalent uh, two pump curve and a three pump curve. So this one's pretty simple. You know, you just stay at 160 uh, feet ahead, you pick whatever this point is the best you can, and then you double it for two pumps and you triple it for three pumps. And if you got four pumps, you have to go <laughs> times four. And if you buy five times however many pumps in parallel you want. And so we do at say 140 uh, feet of head, then we double it, triple it, et cetera. And you pick enough points that you can draw these smooth curves. And that's your equivalent pump curve. You put your system curve on this same plot as we'll see in a minute. And that's where you're going to operate with one, two, or three pumps operating in parallel. Now, do you have to have the, use the same pump uh, when you're doing parallel pumps? And the answer is no, but you got to be a little careful. So this shows three dissimilar pumps. We got a small guy, a medium sized guy, and a large guy right here. Okay. And so you know, if you look at high system head, say 140, what is that? Say maybe 131, 133, whatever that number is, and above, only pump three is strong enough to force any fluid into the system. So if the head in the system was 140, and, operate, and we're operating pumps two and pumps one, guess what? They're water heaters. They're just sitting there spinning because they're not strong enough to push their flow out of the pump into the system. And so we would have to be careful with a system like this, that we didn't let the system head go up here because if you operate these things deadheaded for any significant length of time, you're gonna damage. So that's not good. But as far as the, the combination is concerned, what I can think about is I think about my pump three being my largest, and then I can slide this pump two curve out and kind of connect it, and then it's gonna bounce it out a certain amount, and then I can slide pump one over and connect it to the pump two plus three, and I get a total out here. Or in other words, at 100 feet of head, pump one can produce this much flow, pump two can produce this much flow, and pump three can produce this much flow. So I add up all three of those flows and I put a point out here. And I do that at enough points that then I can draw this smooth curve to represent the total of three pumps in operation. But the caution is that at the higher heads, we're liable to deadhead these weaker pumps, and we just have to be careful. Okay, and so for the series addition, uh, we simply uh, pick a flow, and then th this is showing the same pump. It doesn't have to be, but this, sh this is showing the same pump. So we would take whatever this head uh, that's produced by the first pump and we would double it and then we would triple it. So and this would be an equivalent for two pumps in series. This would be an equivalent for three pumps in series. And then again, I put my system curve on here and it shows me where I'll operate if I operate one, two or three pumps. Okay, motor performance stuff. Uh, we don't have too much time for this. Uh, these are 
probably the most important parameters. Uh, we have uh, motor performance uh, predictors built into PSAT in the background information and in the measure or measure program as well. Uh, you, you go to background information and you can, uh, you can put in basically any motor size and you can see the efficiency power factor and uh, current or percent full load amps. It'll tell you the full load amps. Uh, I'll also show you the motor speed. Uh, well, no, this, the, 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 the speed, I don't think the speed is displayed in uh, PSAT or measure. But at any rate, uh, this is for a 200 horsepower motor. We see uh, if it's uh, putting out 200 horsepower, the speed, uh, it's an induction motor. Uh, it'll be turning, according to the manufacturer, 1785 RPM. Uh, and then as the load decreases at uh, 100 horsepower, if you put it on a, a load that just requires 100 horsepower, it's going to speed up. And then if you put it on no load, it would turn basically at the synchronous speed almost uh, of 1800 RPM. So that's a four pole motor synchronous speed at 60 hertz power is 1800. And then we get the motor slip is the difference between 1800 and your actual operating speed. More slip is more torque on a motor. We see uh, efficiency hangs in there really well at reduced load, 50% load, I haven't paid hardly any efficiency penalty. At 60%, or this is 60 horsepower uh, of 200, this is 40 horsepower. So, you know, my percent load has gone way down and I haven't paid much of an efficiency penalty. So replacing a motor just because it's oversized is probably not gonna yield you much in terms of efficiency. It may help you on power factor, and you may be in power factor penalty. So if you run a bunch of lightly loaded motors, you know, if you're there, this is 50% or less, you know, it's easy to get down here in the 40, 50% uh, power factor range, which if you do enough of that across your whole plant, you'll pay a penalty. And uh, the percent full load uh, amps kind of trail doesn't, doesn't fall. And that's because the power factor is falling so fast it holds the amps up, and that's why the utility doesn't like it. Okay, uh, just some typical uh, uh, efficiencies of different motors from premium to standard efficiency. Large motors these days are going to be anything of any size is going to be 94 to 96 percent. Uh, some of the older ones are not quite there. Uh, okay, if you test, uh, Don tested the uh, this is a, what, a 50 horsepower two pole motor. So that's a 3,600 synchronous speed. The standard, it's a standard efficiency motor was 89% uh, at full load. And th but this is the combined efficiency of the BFD and the motor. And this is three different manufacturers drives. Uh, this data is a little old. It's probably a little better than this now, but it just shows you how, as if you, as you ramp back in speed, uh, you see that the efficiency of your motor drive uh, combination is going to fall off some. It doesn't mean it's not a good idea and you don't want to do it, but you just need to realize that this is going on in the background. That's for a, that's a pulse width modulated drive, which is what the EFDs are. Right? Um, this shows uh, the result of an analysis that was done. This is on a DOE study, uh, I think the old Save Energy Now program a long time ago. Uh, but went in a plant and uh, did some analysis on, on a system, and it was operating right here. Uh, they're roughly 1,400 GPM at about 110 feet ahead. Well, guess what? They got valves pinched like crazy. Open the valve, and this is the, the design point on the system. Um, it's good to measure this if you can. Sometimes you can open the valve for a minute and see where the flow in the head goes. If not, you can take the design point. So we fit two system curves. Uh, this was zero static head, so zero, zero. And then this point defined the system curve with the valve throttled. This, this curve and this point defines the curve with the valve open. So if I just open the valve, I would expect to go to here, but I only need 1400 GPM. So then I can slow the pump down 
If I get it down to about 70% speed, I can produce the same flow at much, much lower head. That's about 45 feet ahead. So that's a significant energy saving. So that's what I save. And then of course, I have to take into consideration any potential uh, efficiency changes uh, on the motor, uh, on the pump, uh, and the motor. Uh, and that's what that's what PSAT would do for you or the measurer tool. Uh, it, we've got some examples where we actually show the PSAT analysis. But that's the kind of stuff, that's what the analysis is going to look like on a typical throttle pumping system. Okay, so let's go back to this now. So this is a particular pump curve. You know, there's different shapes of pump curves out there, but this is one. And this is an all frictional system. Uh, we just want to get a feel for how this system is going to react as I slow down the pump. So at 100% speed, I would be here, and I'm a little bit to the right of BEP. Uh, but, you know, I'm pretty close. So I, that pump is probably pretty happy, close to BEP, and I'm probably getting a pretty good efficiency out of, it, you know, out of the operation of the pump itself. Okay. So then if I slow it down to uh, 90%, you know, I take, uh, it's going to slide down, you know, I shrink the pump curve with the affinity laws and wherever it crosses the system curve where is where I'll operate at 90% speed. Well, that looks okay. You still got a good efficiency. If anything, I'm getting closer to the even. I'll be about the same. And then 80, 70, and I can go on down. You know, there is some minimum speed that the pumps are not functioning very well. You can talk to the manufacturer about that. So we see that uh, this all frictional curve looks like it's going to work really well uh, with speed changes or VFD. Okay, well, let's put the second system curve on there and see what happens. So this is, I have some significant static head, but I also have some friction on it. So I start out over here at my same point. When I slow down to 90%, I notice that, well, my efficiency is changing, okay? Because see, the system curve doesn't have as much slope as the all frictional. And so my operating points change based on the type of system that I'm operating in. And so in this case, because I had selected to the right of BEP, this first decrease actually is gonna increase my pump efficiency. So from 100% to 90%, ah, life is good. You know, that's even better. Okay, well, if I go to 80%, what happens? Well, no, not so much. Now, I'm gonna be at a lesser efficiency by far than I started, or this increased efficiency at 90%. I'm down here, and at 70%, uh-oh, now I'm down to 55%. And, I can't go much lower than 70%. If I went to 60%, my pump curve can't make the static head, so I would be deadheaded. So you see, I'm much more limited in what the VFD can do for me as I have increasing amounts of static head. So static head, you know, is good. Systems can use a VFD to a point, but you got to be careful you don't deadhead them. And you need to figure out where you're gonna spend the majority of your time and take that into consideration in your analysis. This of course is the all static head system, which is not quite possible. There would be some friction on it, but this makes the point pretty well. I start off over here at the same point. If I go down just 10%, I get a radical change in efficiency, but I can still operate there. If I go to 80%, you know, a 10%, uh, reduction in speed, which would be, uh, I, I would jump all the way over to here. Now I'm below 50%, and I can't go to 70% because uh, the, the, the pump doesn't have the strength to make the static pressure. And so you see this static dominated systems don't function as well or as with as much flexibility uh, as a, a static uh, as a friction dominated system. So, you know, that's the point here. And you need to take that into consideration when you start deciding, you know, if you're going to add a VFD to a particular system. Okay. Throttle pumps. Uh, you know, this is a gate valve. Uh, 
we're not actually supposed to use gate valves uh, for throttling, but some people do. <laughs> but this is uh, on the discharge. That's what it looks like. This is on the suction side, so this valve would be wide open, most likely. And this valve, this is a rising stem gate valve. So uh, as you close this down, this stem pops up further and further. If the picture went a little bit further, you'd see that this one is way up here because it's open. This one is not up nearly so much because it's closed. And it's because the pump is big, it pumps too much. Uh, this is uh, on a parts washer uh, of uh, a company, and they had seven pumps in a row like this, by the way. This is a butterfly valve, and you see if this handle was perpendicular to the pipe, it would be closed. So this valve is more closed than open. We read it at 35 to 40% open. But they've done, this is spraying to nozzles on the washer, and they have a desired pressure gauge right here. The pump's over here up through this pipe. And so uh, they don't want to overpressurize the nozzles. They won't work correctly. And so the, they turn the pump on and they pinch the valve until they get the desired pressure here. It works, but it's pretty inefficient. Uh, this is uh, actual measured savings on the seven pumps on that parts washer. Uh, this company had to happen to have a division that made variable frequency drives. So they got a heck of a price on them. They had them in there in two weeks. This was uh, an IAC assessment. Uh, and we got to report actual measured savings in our report. That's probably the first time that's uh, almost ever happened. But anyway, it was a very successful. Uh, this is another system. This is one with a condenser water pump. Um, they removed one of two chillers because the process changed. They no longer needed it. They needed the space, so they removed the chiller. They didn't change the condenser water pump. And so in order to reduce the flow to what was acceptable through the one chiller, they had to throttle this thing at two different locations. So the pump is right down here. And this valve, you can see, if this was straight across, this thing would be closed. You see that white mark? That's where they're trying to, uh, so it's barely open. Uh, and this one, is about, well, they're not both. This one's probably not 30% open. This one's probably 30% open. This is on the discharge of the condenser. And so it was throttled there as well. And so, you know, this is a similar picture we had before. Um, we, we measured the RPM on this one, 1789. We expanded the, the published pump curve to 1789. This is the operating point. Uh, I think I revised the slide from the ones you guys have because it was kind of sloppy. Um, points didn't move a little bit. So I cleaned this one up. But uh, so measured operating points. So it's similar to the one we thought through. But this one, because it's throttled so much, it looked like the operating RPM could be about 1,080 instead of 1,789, which was a significant energy savings. Uh, there's the PSAT analysis of it. So, uh, you know, pump type, RPM, direct drive, no, no belt drive. Uh, this is system of units, standard water, uh, viscosity and specific gravity, single stage, uh, fixed specific speeds. Uh, PSAT does an optimal pump selection. And if you say yes, it stays within the same type of pump pretty much. If you say no, it could look at a vertical turbine pump here, which would not be acceptable. Uh, typical use, leave this. Uh, this is just a toggle switch. I uh, leave it to the yes position. Motor information here, 60 hertz, 100 horse. Uh, Nameplate, uh, 1760 RPM, energy efficient, 460 volts, uh, full load amps. Uh, if you don't know it, you can click the button and it'll estimate it. And we had a 15% service factor. Uh, we had nine, uh, 8,000 hours of operation. So operating fraction would be that 8,000 divided by 8760. Electricity is valued at six cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, measured flow rate was uh, 1780. Uh, initial pump head uh, about 116 feet. And measured motor KW 54.5 uh, 
0.5 kW at 460 volts. And so condition A, 75% pump efficiency. This is costing uh, uh, $26,200 $20, a year. Um, if we go back, we can see we're going to produce basically the same flow at greatly reduced head. So what you do in PSAT, you can copy A to B, which makes all this the same, and then you can change the head. So I put in the head reduction at 53, is what we expected. And if you don't change the motor power, you'll get some really bad efficiency over here. And so the projection was that we were gonna keep the same efficiency, so then you have to adjust the motor KW in order to have 75% pump efficiency at this reduced head. So it's pretty simple, you just keep guessing until this turns up to 75. So the operating cost is then uh, 12,200, and so the savings is 14,000. Um, and yeah, if, if you're gonna do this with a VFD, uh, estimated 15,000, whatever the cost is, you might note that for this uh, revised condition, the optimal, if you replace the pump and motor, you could get uh, PSAT seeds from its uh, uh, algorithms from the Hydraulic Institute that you could get 86.5% uh, efficiency and have a 40 horse motor. So that's then a decision of the plant, you know, and you have to look at the capabilities of the pump. Can I slow it that much off to the pump manufacturer? Uh, so if you put the VFD on, uh, we estimated a cost of 15,000, which gives a simple payback of about 1.1 years. If you're going to replace it, uh, it's going to cost more than that, probably, especially probably get a VFD on the, the replacement pump as well. So that's a decision to plan. Flow control valves. Uh, real quick, uh, this is the basic valve equation. And when you, when you go to, if you just go out there in the field and you find a pinch valve, um, if you know the flow rate and can look up this valve characteristic, you can determine the, the valve flow coefficient to the CV and use this equation to calculate the pressure drop across the valve. Now, this is a simplification. The full-blown equation also has a geometry factor, which is not shown here. Uh, but there, with PSAT, you get a valve tool, which is what I would recommend using. And I'm going to pull that up real quick. This is valve tool. Um, and so this, this uh, will calculate the CV based on upstream, downstream pressure and a flow rate. You also put in your pipe diameters and your valve diameter. And just let me demo this real quick. Uh, I've got 16 inch pipe here, 16 inch pipe here, and a 12 inch valve, which often gets done, you know, to get better authority to the valve. If I change that, notice my CV is, 2371.5. If I change that to a 16 inch valve, I change my CV. And so that's that geometry factor at work in there, which I'm not showing on this slide. So uh, if, um, oh, what in the world? <laughs> I'm messing up. Excuse me just a second. You guys get a break here. All right. So, at any rate, um, you can get these curves online, but you need to know the model number of the valve and the size of the valve. And you can get a curve that shows you CV versus position. Very, very useful. Um, this is these, this shows for butterfly valves. Uh, I think this is probably a ball valve, um, different sizes. So at each different size, you have to get the appropriate curve. Okay, uh, let's go back to the three different systems. This shows a little bit different rendition, but this is now with parallel pumping. And so this is my all frictional. This is the in-between system. 
and this is my static dominated system, which this time we show a little bit of friction on. What I want you to know is look at this all frictional system. All for one pump, they're all selected through 4,500 GPM at 140 feet ahead. But if I turn on this second pump, I'm only gonna uh, I'm only gonna go to this point right here. Wow, that is not much of an increase in flow. I'm 4,500 GPM with one pump, and I don't even get to 5,000 with two pumps. And if I turn on the third pump, it's like 100 or 200 GPM. So you see, you don't want to do parallel pumping with an all frictional system. But look at the static dominated system. So at one pump, we're at the same point. I turn on the second pump, I jump clear out to here because the pump, because the system curve is almost a flat line. I turn on the third pump and I jump out to here. So I get some additional flow for my money expenditure. And I believe these, I size these up, these are 250 horsepower pumps. If I turn on a second 250 horsepower pump, I would like to get some additional flow for it, which I'm not gonna get with this uh, all friction system coming from here to here. Okay, point nine. Uh, parallel pumping example. This is a General Motors plant making uh, uh, engines and they had eight in parallel, they operated five, okay? And this is circulating coolant and stuff was also moving metal shavings uh, from the cutting machines uh, back through a filter to remove them and then circulating. There's a big tank uh, behind this thing that's uh, pretty tall. It's that tank's probably 30 feet tall and runs the whole length of this, is pulling it out. It's not quite water. It's got some lubricants and stuff in it. Uh, there's the analysis, and it's just kind of what we've said. One pump, two, three, four, five. And then this was our equivalent uh, system curve, or this was our system curve. And so you, go, you, you start looking at this, and you go, well, gosh, guys, you're, you're running five pumps. You're not getting all that much out of your fifth pump, right? You're going from what looks like about 8,900 GPM to just sort of 10. So you're maybe getting... Uh, what, 1,000, 1,100 GPM, not all that much in a system this size. So the question was, do we need to operate this? And the answer was no. We do that for insurance because we have to have four. And if we only operate four and one goes down, we fall back to here and this can damage our machines. So we operate the extra pump as insurance. Well, that's $35,000 a year in an insurance policy. So the recommendation was to, can we put auto start on a couple of these pumps, turn off and operate four, and if one was to go down before the head pressure fell very much for very long, we could auto start a pump. So whether or not they did that or not, I'm not sure, but anyway, that's the concept. Um, let me check my time here. I'm running kind of short on time. This shows that you, you can put a VFD on one of two pumps operating in parallel. And you've got to be careful you don't run off the end of the pump curve, but you can do it. Um, this was another system at General Motors that were operating 300 horse pumps. And we logged the header pressure <clears throat> to see if they really needed all of those pumps all of the time. Well, so this is during the day when everything's in operation. They're running about 70 PSI. They might get down in the low to mid 60s occasionally, but every everything was good here. Well, we start shutting stuff down at night and they're still running three pumps. Uh, the idea here is, gosh, we don't need to maintain 95 PSI uh, in the header. Why don't we turn off one or two pumps at night? We could automate this or whatever. And again, this is probably 30, $35,000 a year pump in energy if they ran all the time. This is about six, maybe seven hours a night. So it's probably eight to $10,000 in savings if they can get one of those pumps off during these hours per day. Okay, uh, this is another example. I'm gonna skip through this. This was, uh, this was an interesting place. This was on the Amazon in Brazil, but it was just another example of some um, throttling waste but I want to get to some other stuff for you, piece that analysis. 
here. Um, getting, well, where, where can we get the information? You know, motor tags and stuff like that. You guys know that. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip, uh, estimate things. You know, sometimes you can't measure everything. Uh, this shows an ultrasonic flow meter, which is a strap-on flow meter. Does a really good job if you have clean fluids and clean pipes. Uh, that's Don actually made, taking some gauge elevation measurements. Uh, you can calculate a pump head, go to a pump curve to estimate flow rate if you, you know, don't have a flow meter, can't get a flow measurement, etc. You got to be careful that your gauges are good and that you have the right pump curve, that you know the impeller diameter, all that sort of stuff. Uh, this is a strobe measuring you know you just you, you you can adjust the flash rate on that strobe you can freeze that optically freeze that shaft and determine within a tenth of an rpm uh what speed it's actually operating at a very good trick okay so this one i want to go through and then we're getting close to the end here um okay so let's say that we're called in to do an analysis on this system and so you know, we're going to look at the whole system, but we're going to start at the pump and the motor. So we got a strap on flow meter, we got a suction tank, we got some pressures. Here we go. So here's the data uh, suction pressure 4.3, gauge seven feet above the floor, idea of the pipe for the schedule, size of the pipe 19 and a half, um, discharge 81.2, 12.4 feet above the floor. 12.25 inches, measure 6100 uh, GPM, nameplate on the motor 2300 volts, 1160 RPM, 80 amps rated. The measured current voltage was 77 amps at 2320. And suction uh, measured the rotational speed at 1190. Uh, it operates 90% of the time, and that's with 13 cent power. So this is pretty pricey electricity. Okay, so. Uh, Plug all this stuff in to calculate the pump head. So a pump head calculator in uh, PSAT, just putting in the suction information. Uh, we put in uh, some loss, line loss coefficient 0.5 uh, for this guy and uh, on the discharge side, 1.5, gravity one, 6,100 GPM. You see all the elements of the pump head. So we're about 193 and a half uh, feet of head. Uh, plugging all that stuff into PSAT. Uh, basically, we're just defining the pump and the RPMs and the motor uh, operating fraction 90% of the time, 13 cent power, 6100 uh, GPM, 193 and a half. It doesn't show the half. 77 amps at two, uh, 2320 volts. We got 87.7% efficient. Wow, that's pretty good. And the uh, note, it's costing $271,300 a year to operate this guy. Okay, well, let's check the pump curve. We check the pump curve. Uh, we check uh, 6,100 GPM. Man, we're right, we're right on it. You know, we're, we're, we, we're about 193 feet ahead. It's right on top. So we're operating dead on the pump curve. That's good. There's the efficiency, 6,100 BPM. We read it 88% off of the efficiency curve. We're operating at BEP. It's a happy pump. It's, it's at its, its most favorite operating point on the curve. Wow. So doesn't get much better than this, right? And that's basically what we're saying. Oh, the optimization rating. This is like your grade on the test. This pump got a 97.6 on its test. And you can you can call mom and dad and tell them about that one. Okay? Well, okay, let's go a little bit further downstream. Why? Well, look at this pipe right here. What's this? Oh, it's a recirculation line. Oh my. And it's got a valve, but the valve's wide open. Hmm. That can't be too good. There's a picture of a typical valve. There's a CV curve for the valve, and it's wide open. Take that CV, do some estimation, and the best estimation, flow rate through the recirculation line, 2940. So let's get this right. We're pumping 6,100 BPM very efficiently, 
but we're recircling 2940. So the system is actually using 3160. Oh, that doesn't sound so efficient anymore. Let's go back to PSAT. So I copied A to B on the initial. So now I'm going to go back and everything is the same, except I'm going to change the flow to the flow that we actually needed, the 3160. Okay. And so I plug that in right here. And this is the analysis. But on my pump efficiency, because I'm still using 77 amps, uh, is now 45.4%. And I'm still costing the same amount because I didn't change the power. I just realized I don't need all that flow. And my grade went to uh, 51.6. So maybe we don't want to call home with this result because I went from making an A to making an F on this test. So, wow. And if you know, if we looked at optimal here, we could we could do this for 140, and we could save 131 thousand three hundred dollars if we replace that with the optimal pump, even at this same head. Okay, wow, significant savings. But let's look further. We go on downstream further, and what what do we got? We got valve V1 here. What? Well, and it's throttled. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because if we open it all up, we get more flow than the process needs. If we got it throttled in order to just have 3160. Hmm. And there's a picture of the valve and the valve position. That valve is in the 50%. If that red line was across here, it would be closed. If it was up and down vertical, it would be open. So it's at the 50%. Uh, condition. So we read the CV at 50% and it's uh, 476. We go back to the valve equation. We do, we put it in and we don't need so long. This is good so long as we have the valve is the same size as the pipes. We don't have any geometry factor which we did in this case. So we calculate 44 PSIG differential across the valve. And in this case, in this uh, plant, we were able to measure the pressure drop across the valve, and it measured 39, relatively close to uh, 44. And so we're going to use the 39 because it was a measured value. So 39 PSIG times 2.31 standard water is 90 feet. So in other words, we can, if we replace this pump, we could reduce the head from uh, 193 feet in the base cage to 103 feet. That's a 90 foot reduction in head. So we'd be that. And leaving the power at 77 amps at the initial, now my pump efficiency is 24.2% based on what I'm actually doing. And my grade on the test is down to 27.6. I'm sure not going to call home with this one. That's for sure, man. I bombed this thing. So, and note that potential savings with an optimal pump for this flow and head combination, this operating fraction and energy cost, I could save almost $200,000 a year by changing that pump out. Wow. Now, you don't find that stuff every day. But that's an illustration of what you can find out there, you know, potentially that type of characteristic in a system. So, you know, I think we've summarized this pretty well in the discussion. Oh, and uh, we could replace this with 125 watts instead of the 350 watts on that optimal pump. So, uh, basically, the takeaway is just because a pump is pumping fluid efficiently doesn't mean that the system doesn't have huge energy saving. Uh, we have to look at both. We want to make sure the components are working well. We, but the bigger savings are typically found by looking out there in the system. Okay, that's uh, the end of this, and I will open it for any questions. Tim, uh, do you want to do questions? Right now, or do you want to go into your thing? 
Um, we'll take questions, and I'd like to ask if there's anyone out there that uh, uh, has their mic on. We're getting a little bit of feedback. I ask you to mute if, you're, uh, if you can, and uh, I, much better. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll take any questions now uh, regarding the material that was presented today, and we'll save about 10 minutes at the end for a separate presentation that I'll go over. Uh, does anyone have any discussions or uh, uh, questions as a follow-up to the material that uh, Glenn has presented here? Well, okay. Maybe we'll take per perfect uh, understanding. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. Uh, I will stop the uh, screen share or the recording. Right now. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. And then put your uh, 